the uh, Friends of the Brookline Library annual meeting. Uh, we're thrilled to all have you all here. Uh, just a moment to tell you who we are. The Friends are a private organization made up of uh, people who love the library, who use the library, who want to support the library. And we do that through membership dues, through donations, and through a very, very active used book sale that is open 24-7 every minute that the library is open. And I encourage you all to come and spend a dollar a book or thereabouts uh, anytime uh, you're in the neighborhood. It's a great place. The things we do with that money, uh, which we raise, it all goes back to the library in one form or another, including, uh, for example, the book bike that we got a couple of years ago, which goes to farmers market and senior centers and things like that. Um, the first artist in residence program that we sponsored last year. Uh, as far as we know, the, the really the pilot program was something like this in the greater Boston area, which we were very proud of. Something called Adaptive Technology, which is a program that comes out of our Putterham Library that um, is uh, applications and iPads for people with learning disabilities and things like that. So really, everything that we receive from you, our community, goes to uh, wonderful things that the library might not otherwise be able to do. So welcome and join if you're not a member. But now to the important part of the evening. We have a terrific speaker here, as you all know, and that's why you're here. Um, Anthony Amore is our speaker tonight. He is the head of security for the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. Has been that for maybe 13 years, I think. So. 12. 12 years, to be exact. And, um, and uh, before joining the Gardner, he was involved with rebuilding the security at Bogan after the 9-11 attack. He was a lead agent in responding to the shoe bomber in 2001. All of these things, I think, uh, put him in the public eye in a certain way. And if you read the Boston Globe, you saw him on the front page of the Globe about a week ago Sunday, I think, saying the reward uh, for uh, any information that might lead to the arrest of the people that stole the paintings from the gardener has gone from five million to 10 million. So there it is. I thought, oh dear, he's going to cancel us because he's too busy. <laughs> But happily, that's not the case. He's here for us, he's here with us this evening to tell us a little bit about himself, how he got into what he's doing, and some of the stuff he's doing with it. So, thank you very much. For your thank you very much. That was a good introduction. If you don't mind, I'm going to walk around a bit, croon, maybe say a couple of things for you. Um, so, my name is Anthony Warren, Director of Security at the Gardner Museum and also the museum's chief investigator, looking for the 13 pieces of, pieces of art that were stolen 27 years ago. And I always like to emphasize that I'm the chief investigator uh, for the museum, because I'm really the only investigator for the museum. So, uh, <laughs> that's why I come on give talks, because I pat myself in the back. You know, we've been looking for something for 12 years without finding it. You have to find small ways to reward yourself. <laughs> that's why. But um, I was asked to talk a bit about how I came to do this job, essentially. So I, uh, I started my career, uh, I worked 15 years in agencies that are now considered Homeland Security agencies, all very unpopular <laughs> agencies. In fact, I don't, most of them aren't even around anymore. So if you're over the INS, it's CBP now. I worked for the INS for five years, hardly unpopular. Then I went out to um, I was a special agent with the FAA Security Division. They're going out too. They don't exist. And then after 9-11, as was mentioned, um, I was asked to help rebuild security at Logan. You all know, uh, obviously, that two of the aircraft, two aircraft that struck the Twin Towers departed Logan Airport. So it was a big job. You remember that time? What it was like? And you remember the front page of the paper every day was about Logan Airport, some sort of controversy about the leadership. And uh, one of the things I remember really clearly having to be responsible, well, what I did was uh, when the 1,200 new security screeners were brought to Logan, all federal employees now, they were mine. So one day I had no direct reports, and the next day I had 30 managers and 1,200 screeners, all of them new to the federal government, and um, had to you know, go ahead and protect traveling public, and um, every time I think about that, I think one of the things that the public forgets now, and listen, before I go on, I'm not sitting here as an apologist for the TSA, because I have a lot of criticism. <coughs> Many, and you can ask me about them later. 
But one of the things I will point out, and I remember this very clearly, every morning we had intelligence briefs right after 9-11, and um, they were all about how we're going to get hit again. And uh, I remember the public opinion polls from right after 9-11. The entire population, they were polls that said 90% of Americans believe that we would be struck again aviation, uh, an aviation-related attack. So it was stressful. It was incredibly stressful. But you have to say, for all of its um, uh, bad ideas and uh, odd procedures, the TSA it hasn't happened. It hasn't happened. I mean, I, so I was there 100 days, 100 days after 9-11. I was uh, still a special agent. We hadn't, trans we hadn't transferred over to <coughs> Homeland Security. The law hadn't even been passed yet. And I remember um, I was on the couch waiting for the Patriots to start. It was a really important game against the Dolphins. And the game was going out for the day. And I said, this is the one. And the uh, Patriots game was about to begin. And my boss calls me and says, um, we need you to run over to the airport, the regional head. So we need you to run over to the airport. Um, no, no big deal, but this guy tried to light a cigarette on board the aircraft. You just read him when he comes off. That was common. God, I miss the Patriots. So I, I went over to Logan Airport. I figured I'd be back in the second quarter. And um, I lived in East Boston at the time. It took me from door to door, literally, about seven minutes to get to my office. I come walking in the uh, conference room, and there's one guy there waiting for me. And I'm the lead on this. I'm thinking, why is there a guy here waiting for me? And the uh, speaker phone's on. And I said, why is the speaker phone on? He said, Norad's on the phone. <laughs> Wait a minute. This is just a cigarette. It's not a big deal. Well, wouldn't you know, we're right here, there was a fight on the aircraft. And, you know, as time goes on, you're getting this misinformation because it's coming from the aircraft. Right? It's hard to communicate that way. And um, the next thing you know, I'm running over to the airport to meet the aircraft. And they're taking this guy off. And I'm meeting this guy. I wish you'd read. If, you, if you're around him, yeah. oh, no. this guy was huge. People don't realize that. He was bigger than me. He could barely get handcuffs around his wrist. And then he had this crazy hair, too. So he looked even bigger. The other thing is, this is true. This is, I'm not even trying to be funny, but it's true. When you have these uh, terrorists, when they're in the operational phase of a terrorist attack, they smell. They, 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 it's maybe the fight or flight type thing, but it's indicative of one of these guys that's about to do this. They emit a, a pungent odor. So I saw him, and um, like, lo and behold, that night later, I'm on a conference call with Colin Powell, uh, the head of the FBI at the time, I forget who it was. The White House situation was, I'm like, thinking about the Patriots game. <laughs> <laughs> what is going on? And then, you know, I'll never forget the moment when. You know, I, after that call, I went upstairs to handle the situation for the, for the FBI security point of view. The FBI was, was there, and I was helping interview passengers. And I, I, I talked to one of the bomb guys and said, yeah, he had explosives. I, I still, even as I'm saying right now, I can't believe it. A <coughs> hundred days later, this guy had explosives. It was a whole different world. This, um, these attacks against us were so bizarre. It, it still strikes me 16 years later that these things actually happen. One of the big lessons I learned from it that, that stayed with me throughout my career is that you can have all of the planning in the world about emergency management, and when I was with FAA, we had a bind of this big for every possible emergency. And by law, every air carrier had to have a ground security coordinator who handled X, Y, and Z. Their manager had to do this step by law. Right? So I go down there to handle the situation. It's American Airlines. I, I meet those people. And the first thing they do is, please handle this for us. They were scared out of their minds. They had just lost friends mm -hmm. three months before. And I don't know, what was I going to do? So I had to handle the whole thing myself. And that entire manual was out the window. And you do the best you can. And I learned, you know, that's one of the things I remember even now when I come over to the museum, one of the first things they asked me to do a was write a new emergency manual. And my commitment to the whole thing was making it small, <laughs> you know, making it thin. Just the essentials. And one of the weird lessons you learn about people at museums. Anybody here work at a museum or volunteer at a museum? Interesting. Yes, you volunteer at your museums. <laughs> or at least donate to <laughs> And now a chair for security. <laughs> <laughs> one, of the, one of the first things I learned was that, and I didn't understand it before I went to the museum, but now I do, 
that when you work there, you, you, uh, um, what's the right word? you acquire an affinity for the art and ownership for it. So when I wrote this emergency manual, I had to make sure every couple of pages you have to put in bold to people. <coughs> if there's a fire, a tornado, or whatever, you have to leave. You cannot go and try to save the paintings. Everyone <coughs> life has to take precedence. But I, I will tell you right out, even on camera, if there was a fire with Gardner, I'd run in there because you have to get them. You have to try to save something, you know? And um, so I, I had done all this work at, at uh, Logan Airport. You, you might not remember, before 9-11, um, you're checked baggage, right? You'd go, through, you'd go to the airport, you'd go get screened by the screeners, right, with your carry-on. They'd barely look at the actual machine. You could, you know, we used to test them. We'd go through with a, uh, like a Wiley Coyote bowling ball bomb. <laughs> and empty bag and they miss it, you know? So you go through it over there, and, but, but while you're going through there, your check baggage is right on the plane, no one's looking at it. And after 9 11, the law said all check baggage has to be screened electronically for explosives. And Logan, being a 9 11 airport, and the people at Passport, being really good people, said, We're going to be the first in the nation to do it. So that meant I had to get, get those people out there too. So we put all these gigantic, basically, Cascade machines. And they're still there. And it's an incredible system. But even that, we had to go from zero check baggages, check baggage screen per month to 1.5 million bags per month. And we did it. And I tell you that story because I'm very proud of it because I'm a person who thinks government usually fails when it tries to do things. Right? It's hard to, hard to think of things that government does well and fiscally responsibly. Um, and that's not, that's not a political side of the fence type of comment, that's an observational type of comment in, in my own mind. They did that really well. And so it was a big community effort. So everything was done, and I wanted to do something different in, in Homeland Security moving over to be in charge of the inspections and investigation branch, to look at security issues, and to look at violations, and people who were doing things they shouldn't do. <coughs> so over the course of my career, I had acquired a lot of expertise in facility security, but also investigations. Mm -hmm. That brings me to one Sunday afternoon, the summer afternoon. I was sitting at my kitchen table, leafing through the Boston Globe. I can see her right now. I'll paint the picture for you. The, the sun is setting, lights coming in over the newspaper. Everything's good in the world to me. Looking through the classifieds, and I see security director, Isabella Stewart Garden Museum. <laughs> And it was a little ad like this. It was between my secretary somewhere and uh, service person at Pep Boys or something, right? <laughs> and every time I give this, this type of talk, I, I ask the artist, do you remember these two jobs in the newspaper? <laughs> and act like if you were looking for a job, you'd look in the newspaper classifieds. Now there's no jobs or classifieds to be had, but I wasn't looking for a job, I was just leaving, right? And, I think to myself, this is that place that had that enormous heist. Yeah. And this is how they're advertising for security. <laughs> <laughs> so, me. so I'm kind of quirky in this way. I applied. I've never been to the Gardner before. Is anybody here here who has not been to the Gardner Museum except for Julie? Yeah. Anybody? <laughs> That's awesome. You've all been there. Thank you. Anybody here not been to the MFA? Because I, I love the idea of someone going to the Gardner and not the MFA. <laughs> <laughs> I love the MFA, it's great. Don't get me wrong. But it's very so, I walk in there. Now, you all remember because you've been there. You walk in and you see the courtyard. And I bet every, every one of you right now remembers the first time you saw the courtyard. And I think, too, and I've never seen it. So, I come in. That's where my interview was. I'm sitting on one of those slabs at the courtyard. The guy's talking to me. And I'm looking like this. Like, holy. So, you know, this place is incredible. I couldn't believe my eyes. This is Venice. And he's talking to me, and I'm looking and looking. And uh, I thought to myself, I've been working at the Logan Airport. <laughs> <laughs> and this is what the rest of the world sees. Obviously, they don't. I didn't know what the rest of the world saw, but this is incredible. I can actually walk away from my desk you know, in the middle of a day where I'm feeling like, ah, I'm get away from it for a second, and go look at a Botticelli anytime I want to. So I took the job after some salary negotiations. Of course. <laughs> it is a nonprofit, right? I didn't jump at the job. I took the job. So 
So of course, in the in the course of interviewing for the job, they're asking, "Do you know how to do an investigation into stolen art?" Right? <laughs> of course I do. Of course I do an investigation into stolen but I didn't know. I didn't know. I've been there long enough. They're not going to fire me for this now. I didn't know. I, I, who knows, right? And it's a good reason I didn't know. And I'll put it to you. How many of you have had a multi-million dollar painting stolen from your home? No <laughs> surprise. This is Brooklyn. <laughs> How would you know? How would you know why people really steal them and what they do with them and where they put them, etc.? So I had to get up to speed really quickly. Now I took my Homeland Security experience where you were doing this thing called link analysis. And basically, link analysis was taking all the information you could get on people and then um, putting them into the system and then rating them. Reading, why, you know, whether it was colors or numbers, just say one, two, three, right? And you find connections between people. And for instance, maybe you lived on the same street as a known terrorist, you might be a one or zero. Maybe you lived in the same apartment building as a known terrorist, you might be a two. Maybe you shared the same phone number, now you're a three, you're in the red zone. So I started my own database of everybody who ever contacted the governor about the heist. Not like the public saying, hey, you know how, but every, um, even the psychics, even they went in there because I needed to know if they call again, don't waste my time. I'm a psychic. If there are any psychics in the audience, I'm sorry, forgive me. If there aren't, let me tell you, don't waste your money on psychics. Okay? But, um, so they all went in there, everybody who had a lead, every person who was the subject of one of these calls, everything. And then my own research into the theft, and then my own investigation. So now, that database was empty, and now I have something like 35,000 bits of info in there. And they all have ratings, so when people call, I can jump on those, you know, based on what the numbers are. So, hypothetically, suppose you called up with a really good lead, something I need to follow up on. I put that person in there, I do all kinds of public records <coughs> on them, put everything from that public record, search all their past addresses, because this is an old crime, so you need to know where and what they're doing to start with. The other thing I did was um, stop looking into art map and actual heists to see who does these things, what happens to the paintings, what efforts work to recover them. The rewards work, um, where are the paintings usually recovered, so I started this database of art heists. And this thing's enormous, and I was very ambitious. I said, I'm going to catalog every art heist for the last hundred years in this database. So I decided to go through newspapers, I got access to different databases and such, but it was only 12 short years ago, and I actually had to go to the library and use a thing called microfiche. <laughs> I, mean, sorry, so I don't know if you remember microfiche. But I talk, give talks at colleges, and some kids are looking at me like, what are you talking about microfiche? What is that? So this is my plan. So what I meant by heist was <laughs> any, any, um, any type of art theft uh, and, and that's a really good question because I would want to see where is art stolen most frequently. So I'd look at a theft and I'd see art heist and the thing, in the thing I'd put the day of the week, the time of the day, um, who the artists were that was stolen. Was it a home, a church, a, a library? A lot of art stolen from libraries, um, a museum or a gallery, essentially. And one of the things I found was art is most frequently stolen from homes. So a tip to you is if you have valuable art in your home, and I define it as art you care about, right? don't tell people. <laughs> Enjoy it yourself. Okay? So if you're walking your contractor upstairs to the attic because you have an electrical problem, don't stop and say, this is a beautiful little Matisse, my great art game. You know, it's so important to me. Okay, let's go, because it's going to disappear. Okay? And you need, and another tip I'll give you, is when people work in your home, know who they are and keep a record of it, always. I cannot emphasize how important that is. So I keep that sort of information. Um, again, the artist, the, the, the method of the theft, were the uh, violence, did they have weapons, did they use the weapons, did they handcuff, duct tape, uh, zip tie, uh, were they men or women, the thieves, were they wearing masks, how were they, how were they disguised, how long did the heist take, how far from the heist was the art found, if it was, was a reward, used, and if it's recovered, how long after, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So I, I start going back 100 years, very proud of my database, 
And within like an hour, I said, this is a waste of time. <laughs> because there's so many archives that had no idea that art theft, art crime, is a six to eight billion dollar per year illicit industry. Every year. That includes looting, fraud, art heist. So what am I going to do? I can't, I'm not going to get up to speed. <coughs> you know. So then I thought, well, God would have lost three Rembrandts that night in a unique fashion. Let me just focus on Rembrandt. And I went back 100 years and I started accumulating all these stories about Rembrandt heist. I found 81. And um, got every bit of information I could get about them and put it away in a folder and said, this will make a good book someday. And then one day I wrote a book called Stephen Rembrandt and it tells the lessons you learn from these heists. And here are some of the lessons you learn. I'm not going to give them all away because I coincidentally have Stephen Rembrandt for sale here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm not going to take it seriously. I mean, it, these are anecdotal stories, um, but they're interesting. They're pretty, the most interesting that tell the story the best, but there's valuable lessons. Number one, <coughs> art thieves are nothing like you see in the movies. And they have no, they bear no resemblance to the Thomas Crown Affair, <laughs> or to the Trapment, or to any of these movies. Okay, nothing in common. For instance, how many of you have seen the Trapment, Sean Connery and Captain Zeta Jones? There's a famous scene in there where he's showing her how to rob a museum, he duct tapes, uh, puts uh, a blindfold on her. And um, sets up this room with all these motion sensors and she makes her way around them. Now, I looked at that database of mine now has 1,300 heists in it, and not one time in any of those heists was the thief blindfolded. Pure <laughs> mechanism of the movies. Second thing, though, is that there's no such thing as these red laser beams you see in the movies. Those are silly. If, you, if we use those, suppose they were in this room and I was coming to rob one of these paintings, I would know where to step and where not to step. I'd be doing all these weird this rare group, right? They're, 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 they're invisible. I think you might have some in here. <laughs> no. You are. But, they, but they're invisible. They're set up on an arc, and, and they're not these red laser beams. So you learn a lot of stuff like that. Like the movies, you can't rely on how they do. And that's important because even police agencies, they, they rarely deal with art heists, right? So when it comes up, they use in the frame of reference from popular media. So they're thinking, oh God, that mask would be stolen. That must be, they all say it, and some of you are thinking it, in, so, in some billionaire's basement, and he's enjoying it for himself. <laughs> and he sent these guys out to steal the paintings. You know how many times that's happened in real life, where a billionaire has sent the guys out to steal a painting, theft to order? Zero. Right? It's a movie thing. It's called the Dr. No Theory. And the Dr. No Theory comes from a movie called Dr. No. It was the first Bond film. And what happened was, it's a great illustration. When the movie, the movie was uh, based on um, the book by um, Ian Fleming. <coughs> Fleming didn't write this part of the book. Bond is led off to dinner by Dr. No in his underground lair. While they were making the film, a painting by Goya called the Duke of Wellington was stolen. And it was a huge story stolen from the National Portrait Gallery. It's a very important painting. The whole country was wondering where did it go. So they put it in the movie. <laughs> and Bond walks by it and he stops and looks back like, oh, there, 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 that's where that went. So people think that's what really happens. <laughs> the true story is an old time pensioner in London named Benton um, Kempton, take that back, Kempton Bunton, and his son went to the museum because they were upset about their BBC tax, right? They go to the museum, they hide in the bathroom and the place closes. They come out, they steal the painting, and they go out the bathroom window. And they kept it in their flat, um, asking the BBC to lower its tax. That's who really stole it. While the world is thinking, it's Dr. No. It's that type of person. Right, so the, the big lesson you learn from these art heists is that the people who really steal them are not these master criminals. They're not these master thieves. They're not these guys who, you know, you all picture the guy in the, the, the black balaclava and the black turtleneck of pants and propelling through the skylight and talking about the things they steal. That's not the way it happens. That's happened a handful of times in history. It's guys who, who rob banks, who, who knock over armored cars, who do home invasions, who sell drugs, steal cars. Those are the guys that are stealing art as well. Because someone plants a bug in their ear that art is easier to steal than diamonds and jewels or money from a bank. 
Because as you know, if you, especially today, if you decide to rob a bank, don't. But if you decide to, you're going to get you're going to uh, get away with a couple of thousand dollars. That's it. Like, Pete, when you read there's been a bank robbery in your neighborhood, you can bet your bottom dollars it's related to drug addiction. Okay. So when thieves hit a bank, they know what they're basically going to get, and they know how far they're going to get to. Because you know, if you go to a bank, you expect if they have bulletproof glass between you and the teller, do you say, "I'm not banking here anymore"? No, you just use the bank. You expect it to be a vault. If you go to a, a jewelry store and you walk in and they have to buzz you in, and you go in and, and the in the um, the cases are sort of like a labyrinth, slow you down, and there's an armed guard maybe and they really watch you closely if you look at the jewels, you expect it. You don't take umbrage to that, right? But at a museum, you're supposed to be able to walk all the way, go inside as a visitor, and see a $50 million painting and stand at it like this and talk to your friends and stuff. You can do that. It's all about accessibility. And that's why people rob art from museums. Believe it or not, that database has shown me that more than half of all art heists happen when the place is open as close to what is closed. Because if you're going to rob a place at night, it happens at night, but if you're going to rob a museum at night, it's a fortress. It's all locked up. The alarms are all on. The guards are there just looking for you. Right? So you have to get through that. You have to get through the perimeter. If you rob a museum in the daytime, again, don't. But if you <laughs> rob a museum in the daytime, half the job's over. You're in the place. Right? So half the battle's over. You're, you're at the item you want to take. And nobody's saying anything to you when you get close to it. Now, that means for someone like me, my challenge is to make your exit with that piece, if you're able to get it off the wall, twice as hard. And at the garden, we've done that really successfully. How many, how many of you have been there since we opened the new wing? Almost all of you, right? So you know it's a long way from that door to the art, right? So if someone said, hey, somebody grabbed a painting in, in <coughs> the Raphael movie and the, uh, they're running out of here, I could say, oh, okay. Hold on a sec, finish my coffee, <laughs> take a call, put it down, run down the stairs, trip them on their way out. <laughs> but I'm exaggerating, obviously, but it's a long way. Right? And the reason I tell you this is because when I first started at the Gandhi, you remember when the entrance used to be on the Fenway? You'd go in the entrance, there'd be a ticket counter on your right, and on your left would be the yellow room. And in the yellow room would be priceless dig out painting of Madame uh, Gojolin. There's the doing the yellow. There's the first Matisse in the American collection, and it's about, it was literally from here to the elevator from the street. And he's giving me fits, and I don't have to worry about it anymore because of the way the building's configured now. So I learned that the types of people who do this and when they do it. Yes, sir? Has anyone taken an art off the wall and put a wall down? Heck no. <laughs> <laughs> we'll try that. That's all the questions, I and mean, we'll do a QA. and a so just okay. a few things, and we'll so um, another thing I learned about these art heists, and this is really critical, is that when someone steals, now I'm talking about masterpieces, right? When someone steals a masterpiece, there's no market for them. There's nobody to sell them to. And history shows, and coincidentally in the book shows, that when people steal something like this, they, it's a crime of opportunity, they don't have a lot of foresight, and they're not really caring what they're gonna, how they're gonna sell it, the goal is to steal it first. They get these pieces, and then they can't sell them because they're too recognizable, they're too um, hot, everyone's looking for them, and they're uh, too expensive, right? So if you steal a painting, like for instance, let's take the most valuable stolen thing in the world is the concert by Johannes Vermeer, stolen from the Gardner, mm -hmm. right? Sometimes I'll say it's worth around $200 million. Gross, uh, 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 grossly underestimated. Grossly underestimated. It's worth probably closer to three hundred million dollars. It's incredible, right? It's thirty-six. It's one of only thirty-six pieces. It's an incredible. If you know Vermeer, you know. Well, I can see why. Imagine if you had it and you wanted to sell it and you wanted pennies on the dollar, right? And you said, "I'll take ten cents on the dollar." Who's going to give you thirty million dollars? <laughs> Right? Or you say, I'll take, you know, who's going to give you 300000 for something that could never show anybody and only wind them, uh, end them up in jail? There's no market for them. So what happens is they wind up getting hidden. And that's what makes it really hard to find. Because Whitey Bulger is hard to find, right? 
But why do you make mistakes? Because people make mistakes. Paintings don't make mistakes. They sit where you left them, right? And people leave them in places you would never think of. And in movies, you would think, oh, they put it on the back of a, a bookcase, and you pull the lever, and the bookcase turns around, and there it is, that sort of thing. Or a Swiss ball, but it's actually harder than that. <coughs> right? So in, in my book here, um, I mentioned there was this big theft at the Worcester Art Museum in 1972. And it was the first time a uh, place was robbed at gunpoint. And I know the guy who stole it. Right? And where do you think he hid it? He hid it in a hay loft at a pig farm in Johnston, Rhode Island. Who's going to look there? Right? Nobody. I've talked also about a guy who I've become really friendly with. Have you ever heard of Miles Connor? Yeah. Yes. World's greatest art thief by a long shot. shot. He robbed the MF, he robbed every place, but he robbed the MFA in 1975, and he stole this priceless Rembrandt and used it to get a, uh, get a sentence reduction. And he set a precedent, wor precedent worldwide for using art as a get-out-of-jail-free card. Yeah. Right? Where was that painting when Miles had to turn it into, into the police to complete the bargain? It was under his friend's mother's bed in the North End. <laughs> she didn't even know it was there. Who's going to think that? She's going to bed at night not knowing there's a, whatever it was, $50 million right now. <laughs> You're eating in a restaurant in North End, it's right above your head, you don't even know. So who would know? So that's the likely scenario with the Gardner paintings. Right there. They're not on some uh, sultan's wall. The Koch brothers don't have them, despite how many times people have called us saying the Koch brothers are Dick Cheney. <laughs> you, know, you can tell you're in Massachusetts by like, who the villains are. You call, oh, it's Cheney or Koch or, you know. <laughs> they don't have them. But these things get hidden, and it's very hard to find them because again, they, don't, they don't make mistakes. They don't peek their head out the window. They don't talk to Miss Iceland. Like what you probably did. We're not going to the questions yet, but I'll, I'll, I'll pre save it. Um, and that's what makes them hard to find. So the Gardner theft, as you know, happened on March 18, 1990, at 1.24 in the morning. And these two thieves pull up and they park in the employee entrance, which isn't even there anymore, on Howes Road. And they approach the intercom and they say, Boston police were responding to a disturbance. And the guard at the watch desk, the overnight guard, says, okay, he lets him in. And policy and his training was that you call the police. And that's still the policy everywhere. It's a no-lose situation. If the police show up and you didn't call me down 911 because if they're supposed to be there, you'll not know. And if they're not supposed to be there, the real ones are on their way. But he didn't, he just let them in. And that was the biggest mistake in the history of property protection. As you probably know, the Gardner theft is the biggest theft of anything ever, anywhere. So these two guys come in. There's only one other guard on duty. The two thieves approach the watch desk. Suppose, suppose the guard is sitting here facing me, and I'm the bad guy, dressed in a police uh, outfit. And I say to the guy, um, yeah, we're here for a disturbance. Anything special going on tonight? The kid says, no. I say, anybody that's working with you tonight? He goes, one other guy. We'll get him down here so he radios the other guy comes down 45 seconds later. The other cop is standing around the corner, sort of, looking at the basement stairs. This guy does all the talking. And he says, um, when the other kid shows up, he says, you know, these, kids, these guys are both young. They're in their early 20s, guys. And uh, kind of hippie-ish, um, slight of build. They're not there to put up a fight. No one's training them to fight bad guys. So he says, um, I thought that was my family coming. So he says, um, you know, you look familiar. It is. There we are. Yeah. The vaccine, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> so, um, perfect on cue. He says, let me see your ID. The kid she hands the ID and goes, you know, I think I, think I know you. Do I, I, do I know you from somewhere? The kid says, no. And he says, uh, yeah, there's a warrant out for your arrest. Come out from behind there. So the kid comes out from behind the desk. Now the two guards are out near the cops. And the cop says to the two kids, you're under arrest. And he says, assume the position. Do you remember that expression in the TV shows? That's another thing. You say that to young people, they have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> but um, 
when I change Maxine's diaper, I try to say, assume the position. <laughs> so, they, so the kids know what to do. They get up against the wall and they handcuff them. And then they, after the cuffs around the two guards, the cop says, gentlemen, this is a robbery. Follow what we tell you to do. I'm paraphrasing. But follow what we tell you to do. Uh, you won't be harmed. We're not here to hurt you. We're here for the honor. And one of the kids says, they don't pay me enough to put up a fight, which is true. So they take the kids down the stairs, the staircase the guy was looking at. They separate them by about 40 yards by handcuffing their cuffs to pipes in the basement. They have duct tape all over them. They cover them with duct tape. They go upstairs, and they um, head up to the second floor directly to the Dutch room. The Dutch room is the one that has the big empty frames in it. Here's what's really interesting. They don't go upstairs to start stealing things until 24 minutes has elapsed. All right, now I told you about this gigantic database. In all of history, in the last 100 years, 24 minutes, that would be about the third longest hour heist in history. They had just started 24 minutes into this. Right, in all, they were in the museum for 81 minutes, which is an incredibly long amount of time. What does that tell you? They were comfortable, they knew the cops weren't coming, they knew something about security there. In that 81 minutes, they leisurely took 13 pieces of art. They went into the Dutch room directly from the Rembrandt paintings. And that's what the goal of the theft was, to steal all four of our Rembrandts. They took all four of our Rembrandts off the wall, they forgot one. But they took the Storm of the Sea of Galilee, Lady and Gentleman in Black, and a small self portrait at church. They took the Vermeer of the concert, and they took a painting by Goldberg Flink, which they thought was a Rembrandt. I think they thought all of them were Rembrandts. So after they get all the frames down, the other guy goes through the early Italian room, walking by um, a Fra Angelico painting, priceless object, through the Raphael room, walking by Raphael and Botticelli, and into the short gallery, where he takes five works by Degas. Now we have eight Degas works, Monetarily, these are the five least valuable by far. Mm -hmm. right? They were horses and jockeys for the most part. These were not stolen to order. These were not some guy wants these things for his collection. It doesn't happen. And then they started to take this Napoleonic flag. They gave up on that. They took the bronze finial off the top. So there's 12 of the pieces. Right? And then at some point in the night, we don't know when, they went to the blue room on the first floor and they took Manet's shade for Tony took that painting down, and that's the one where they took the frame with them and left it in the security office. So 81 minutes later, essentially, they leave, and they've taken 13 pieces, and the value of the 13 pieces, at minimum, is around $500 million. Right, they just pulled off the biggest heist in the history of the world. They get back into their car, and they disappear. And paintings, we've had some sightings, but you have to remember, when you're talking about people telling me they've seen our paintings, they are, I've had people telling me the truth. They believe they've seen our painting, but you will never know for sure if it was ours or not. I'm saying they're telling the truth, but memory is a difficult thing. As an example, a guy called us right after we talked about the paintings, possibly one painting going to Philadelphia. And that was possibly. A um, guy calls us and says he saw Storm of the Sea of Galilee in Pennsylvania. So we get it very closely. How big was it? Because most people say, oh, well, three by three. The storm is five feet by four feet. It's really big. He says, it's very, very big. It's very, and, all right, he's not in money. Describe it to us. He describes the whole painting to us. And who had it? And the guy who tells us had it turned out to be a, um, a guy with some, maybe some questionable connections. And the story about how he had the painting seemed questionable. Like, why would he have this? Get in the car and drive to Pennsylvania right away. Get to the place, talk to the lady and said, let me go down and look. You go in there, you look around, and there's this painting, and it's exactly as he described, but it's not the storm of the Sea of Galilee. It's a boat in the same position. It's a big wave against the boat. It's a beautiful, nice painting. It's not some piece of garbage, but it's not ours. And if I showed you a picture of it, you'd say, boy, I can see why in his mind's eye, that was the storm of the Sea of Galilee. So did that guy really think he had seen it? Sure, he was being honest, but it wasn't our painting. That's what makes it really difficult, especially with 27 years having passed. So <clears throat> that's where we are today, doing that sort of thing, chasing every single lead that comes down the pipe. 
You've seen leads in the paper, things like we've done in Connecticut and elsewhere. Um, and we continue to do them every single day. We get leads every day. We get, I get them through via email, telephone, letters, um, when I give talks, you name it. Uh, and we follow every single one of them. And a lot of them are crazy, but you have to follow them. You have to follow every one. Um, I'm almost done talking. <laughs> so uh, we continue to do that. I work really closely with the FBI and the U.S. Attorney's Office, and they're phenomenal, really committed to getting these paintings back. Um, and as you know, we took the world's largest private reward of $5 million and doubled it to $10 million. We did that because we want the public to know how serious we are about getting the paintings back. <clears throat> it's been 20 years since we raised it to $5 million. And there are people out there, believe it or not, who think that we're not honest about this reward. As if the trustees of the museum, the pillars of Boston, are going to put the names behind something that's a fraud. We, we raised it to 10 and sent a message to the public that we are deadly serious about paying this. Sometimes people think, have said, CNN had it. Did anybody see the article on CNN today? There's an article on CNN about the reward that was inaccurate from A to Z. <coughs> And they, they fixed it, right? So there, for, I got an article that's A to Z, now it's like D through F. It's like this big but there are people that think we did it out of desperation, and I will be honest with you, we've been desperate since March 18, 1990. Of course we're desperate. Who wouldn't be desperate to have these things back? Most of you know Mrs. Clinton's <coughs> like, right? She gave this thing to the public. It's unprecedented. She built this incredible museum, spent all her money on it, and at her death said, this is for the public, for their enjoyment and education for <coughs> One of the most underrated women, never mind people, but women in American history. She should be on the $10 bill. And right? she did this incredible achievement on her own. Only place in the world, basically, that's built by, named for, conceived by, designed by, paid for by a woman. <coughs> right? Incredible figure in history. She gave this to us. We need them back. There's only one place that those 13 pieces should be, and it's on the walls that she built. And as you know, Will says nothing can ever change, right? So if there's ever at a time where something is truly priceless, it's our opinions because it can never be sold. So that's where we are in the investigation today. Is that, should I take questions now? Yeah. So I'm happy to answer any questions you have about anything I talked about. Most importantly, books will be for sale when I'm done. And, um, <laughs> But I do want to thank you for, for listening about my personal journey here. And uh, I hope you all keep your eyes open about the Godfather. Okay. Stolen and come back, they're always uh, repairable. 
And servers at the guide are my estimation of the best in the business. My job is to find them, their job is to fix them. Hey, there's an instance where a, a reverend was stolen from the Young Museum in the, in the early 70s. Thieves took it, couldn't sell it, too valuable, they sent it back 30 years later. And it was in such bad condition that the mold separated the paint from the canvas. And they fixed it. Our conservative, he would kill me for saying this, I'm so, so glad to say it. Great guy, John Franco Copeland, has taken a painting on a wooden panel, removed the paint, put it on the canvas. Right? Once I heard that, I said he can do anything. So I'm not worried about the condition. I know the condition will be okay when they come back and they'll be fixed. The other part about we won't prosecute is, well, we're not a prosecutorial agency, we're a museum. But the U.S. Attorney's Office has said they will entertain immunity in the right conditions. I mean, obviously, if someone says, hey, here's your paintings, I just murdered four people for them, we're not going to say, don't worry about it. But under the right conditions, there's immunity. Uh, the, the people who stole the paintings are not eligible for the reward, but we believe they're deceased. And the only crime, I mean, there's a number of crimes that you could contort into this, but the main one would be, two, interstate transportation of stolen property and possession of stolen property, which are ongoing crimes. So there's no statute on them until they're handed in. We have that all in place. I can assure you that if someone came forward to us with the paintings, they would get the reward if they led us directly to the guy. That's the interesting thing. Too. You don't have to bring us the paintings for the reward. You have to tell me. You have to lead me directly to them. That's it. I'll get them. Just tell me where they are. I'll go tell me who has them. I'll find them. We'll get them. You'll get your reward if we get all 13. And if not, we'll prorate it. And um, we'll keep your name uh, private. And we'll talk to the U.S. Attorney's Office. The whole situation is there. Some people thought it was too good to be true. It's another reason we double the rewards. And no, it's not real. Yes? What happened to the guards? Uh, you mean? The, the museum guards. Were they fired, you mean? Or? <laughs> yeah. No, it wasn't Did there. Did they go to therapy or something? <laughs> <laughs> it was so bad for them, tied up and. Yeah, it's traumatic. It's a very traumatic event, I mean, yeah. obviously. You know, it wasn't a violent crime per se, but it's violent. I mean, that's easy for me to say. Well, when two guys come in and they tie you up at night and they blindfold you in that way, it, you know, it's scary. It's two young guys. So, I'm going to bear well. Okay. Yes, ma'am. So, if you can't sell the painting, what's the motivation for stealing? Can you hear my question? Yeah. If you can't sell the paintings, what's the motivation for stealing? The motivation is to sell them. But art, there's no art piece in the audience tonight. They don't come and listen to lectures by me or read my books. They don't do research. They don't come here and say, let me look into the history of art. No, they steal art. Now, that's a segue to Miles Connor. Because every time I talk about these stories, I'm talking about 99.9% .9 of art thieves. There's one guy who's the outlier, and that's Miles Connor. And Miles, I've mentioned before, is the world's greatest art thief. Nobody has stolen art in the numbers for the reasons and the quality that Miles Conner did, the guy from Milton. And he is the outlier. You can't put any, he would steal art for reasons that can't be, ex you would never anticipate them. I'm gonna tell you one of them. He, I told you one already, he did to get out of jail. He still run the MFA. Um, he went to the Mead Museum one time in Amherst. Has anybody been there? Small museum. He goes in the museum. This is in the 70s. Miles is an art, he knows art. He's a uh, connoisseur of Japanese swords and Japanese art. And he likes Dutch paintings. And he immense on that art. He's very smart. And he goes in one day, and he's there to see the art. And he's looking around, and he sees a painting in an office, and he thinks it's a Goldberg flint. He goes in the office, and he's observing it, and he's enjoying it. And he's trying to see, is this a flint? The curator comes in, and sees him there, and starts yelling at him. What are you doing in my office? Get out of my office, blah, blah, blah. And Miles, he doesn't realize he's with one of the most dangerous men in America, yeah. right? And Miles says, I'm sorry, sir. Uh, he has a very clipped accent. He sounds like Anthony Hopkins when he talks. <laughs> and he says, is that a Goldberg flank? It's beautiful. And the guy yells at him even more. Get out of my office. I'll have you removed. This is a working office. And Miles leaves, and he goes, and he studies the rest of the museum. And he goes home to Milton. And then he borrows a van and drives back and steals four paintings from the museum. That's the way the guy treated him. And I can tell you, that is unprecedented. Right? And that's just one of his stories. I'm sorry, but I have to tell you one more. <laughs> I love this one. There's a million of them. I'm like Shecky Green. 
He's when he's 17 years old, his father's a cop in Milton, Massachusetts. He is like the cop's cop, the guy every community wants, the guy who gets out and helps you with the right? His father is an upstanding man and he's a collector of antique weapons, just like Miles' grandfather. And he has antique guns. One night somebody robs a Forbes, you know the Forbes house in Milton? Yeah. yeah. One night somebody robs this place of its um, of antique guns. Who, who knows who did it? Nobody knows. So the police, uh, the people that run it, say, I want Joe Connor questioned. And the police are like, Joe Connor would never do this. No, I want him questioned. They pulled him in and they embarrassed him. Miles' his father. Of course he didn't do it, and he didn't. And he came home that night and was really dejected. And it's a lot of class warfare there. These were blue blood type people at the Forbes house, and he's in the Congress, you know. So the father's eating dinner and he's dejected, and Miles sits down at the table and he's having 17. And he's like, Pop, what's wrong? And he tells him the story, Miles, you're not going to believe what they did to me today. I'm really hurt. You know, this is my character there, impugning. Miles is eating. He said, Dad, they did that to you, Dad? And he said, Yes, they did. Let this be a lesson to you, you know. Miles said, Okay. And then later that night, he went and robbed everything out of the Forbes house. <laughs> 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 Miles is probably five, six. He's taking these big pieces of um, pottery. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh because it's horrible, right? <laughs> the only place he didn't rob was the Godner. And the God, he was in jail in California when the Godner happened. And in a weird way, I shouldn't, I shouldn't say this. I'm, I think you'll understand what I say. In a weird way, I wish he had because we have him back now. Because he appreciates the stuff. He talks to me, tells me, he understands Mrs. Godner's uh, legacy. You know, he, he, we have it. But uh, that's a very long answer to your question. Art leaves is crime of opportunity. They don't research any crimes first. They do it, and then they deal with <coughs> it. Moving on. And they continue to steal them every day. Yes. Uh, has any of the paintings been uh, checked out in other countries, even if they have been overseas? <laughs> uh, there's never, you know, we check everywhere. And they're on Interpol and international police agencies, everything. Believe it or not, there's a lot of people in Europe who know about our museum and our theft better than a lot of Bostonians. And um, they're not there. And I would bet my bottom dollar. Someone had to go overseas and check it out. Yeah, they would, yeah we had to do a couple of trips overseas. Um, once uh, the FBI and the Gaza people went to Japan because people have this thing in their head, oh, a rich Japanese industrialist must have one of this home with it. It's not in the movies, again. <laughs> and uh, France a couple of times. But always remember this key, you know, maybe I'm wrong, this might be the outlier, but painting stolen in America stay here. We're consumers of stolen art. Art stolen in Europe comes here, but our stolen art doesn't go there. So we don't have, we don't, we haven't had any good leads about, and the stuff about the IRA and white culture is just hogwash, it has nothing to do with our family. Two questions, what is, what is your friend up to now? Miles? Uh, well, that's hard to say because there might be stuff that's still missing. I, the the well, first one that comes, first that comes to mind, ooh, maybe that the Young Museum, thirty-five years. Mm -hmm. There's stuff that was stolen in '72 from the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts, still missing. That's forty some odd years. Um, but when you talk about masterpieces, they're either recovered right away or a generation later. So time doesn't always work against you because the scariest bad guy dies, that sort of thing. People get divorced. You know, and ex-wives start talking about what their husbands went to done. So we get a lot of good information because of the passage of time. Mark. Uh, so sometimes when we're getting chased, I hear a lot of, it's a lost cause, those pieces are gone forever. Mm -hmm. How do you react? Do you have any proof that you know they're, they're certainly out there? The question was basically how do I, you know, do I have any proof that the stuff is still out there because you do hear stories that it's probably destroyed or gone forever? <coughs> in all the research I've done, for instance, in the Rembrandts, there's, of all of the 81 Rembrandt heists, only once was a Rembrandt destroyed, and that was in 1938. These are too valuable and too easy to hide to destroy. And even ours, they're in different mediums. So one, some are on uh, canvas, some are on uh, wood. There's some objects. Uh, it's just incredibly rare for someone to destroy such valuable things when they're so easy to hide. 
Um, and I would go the contrary, the contrary to the way you phrased it and say there's no evidence that they have been. I do think that if, if they have been destroyed, we would have heard from someone, listen, this guy had them and he, he destroyed them before he died or something. One of the things when you're looking for an object, like paintings like this, you can never stop looking, ever. Right? You, you will have to keep looking until you recover them. You can't, you can never say, you know what, they're probably destroyed. Um, and I know, I, I never will give up looking for them. Yes, ma'am? I'm assuming there weren't any video cameras, right? No, there were some cameras, but this was 1990, so they were, there weren't many of them, and they were on, um, they were on VHS tapes, and the ones that captured the guards, were, they took the tape when they left. Did they wear, like, a mask? No, they were dressed as cops. Yeah, but we don't have any video because the tape was taken. Yes, ma'am. I saw a program on television. I thought it was a documentary, and they, were, they interviewed one of the guards, and he said that um, the other guard didn't show up for work that night. Yep. And when the when the policeman came to the door and he, he let them in, one of them asked him, "Is it is there is, is there a substitute?" No. No, that's close. Uh, there was a guy that called him sick that night. Yeah. Um, but he's like completely vetted. I have every confidence that that was innocent. Uh, but no, they didn't say anything about a substitute or anything. They oh. just said, you, this, how many guys work with you tonight? Oh. <coughs> yes, sir. Oh. <coughs> how were you able to establish the timeline if you said you had no, not much video, not much communication? We have the motion sensor readouts. So the thieves took the sheet from the dot matrix printer. Remember those things? Yeah. Yeah. And they took the sheet with them because it's 1990, they're not smart guys and they don't realize you just have to print again. So you hit print and we see how they moved about the museum on the motion sensors. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, sir. Um, two questions. One, if the will said that you couldn't change anything, how did they destroy the carriage house? Mm -hmm. And two, in your most perfect guess, where might the paintings be? Uh, the first part about the carriage house, the carriage house is not part of the permanent collection. It's the permanent collection that can't be changed. Um, for instance, there's parts of like the first floor that are considered permanent collection. So they can make any changes like that. Second, in terms of where I think they are, they're probably within 60 miles of where we are now. Mm -hmm. Just because historically that's where these paintings wind up. I don't think they move very much or very far because we probably have more intel on them. Yes, ma'am. Good question. Was it where, where the paintings were removed from the frames a clue? And that's what I was trying to find out when I did that da database. And no, lots of times paintings have been cut from frames. It's very common. Uh, not very common. It's, it's happened though. It's not unique. Um, and to leave the frames behind, it's very common. Yes, ma'am. Have there been other thefts um, from the garden? No. No, that's, that's the uh, theft. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 The other book I have for sale is what happened was I, I was going to <coughs> talks like this and telling people, you know, you can't make money selling these masterpieces. And then I'm also telling you, I told you tonight, it's six to eight billion dollar per year industry. Right? But that doesn't necessarily jive, right? There's something in continuity in there. Well, I want to look at where does, you know, where does this money come from? Number one, uh, it's, there's tons of theft of lesser paintings, even very valuable ones, but ones that aren't kind of recognizable. Right, that's, it, they get stolen a lot. A lot of stuff like you see in galleries in Newburyport, uh, in Newburyport, in Newbury Street too, like prints and, and such, those are stolen all the time. Uh, another place that this money comes from is looting of archeological sites, historic sites like in Italy and Greece, and increasingly in the Middle East with ISIS and different groups of Steelies, uh, traffic them for money to do this horrible things they do. And then the third way people make money illicitly in art is frauds and forgery. So I decided to write a book about that too, getting an idea of how that works and what people do. So that's called The Art of the Con. It's a New York Times bestseller. Yeah. Um, I thought you were going to applaud when I said that. <laughs> <laughs> that's unique, but, but one of the things I've learned in that book is it's the only one on forgery that makes the claim I do is, and I believe it, 
the, the, um, the key to a successful art forgery fraud is not in how good the artist is, because the artist is never really that good. It's all about the con, right? It's all about the guy who comes up with the clever pitch to the willing dupe who wants to believe so badly that he has something, no, he, he's got to get something no one else has ever had, that they suspended his faith <coughs> and believe the chutzpah of the con man. It's phenomenal to think that that's why that book, I think, did so well, because people read it, they can't believe what people fell for. However, people continue to fall for it. So that's what that book's about. Thank you. Right. I'll yes, take sir. a couple more questions. I don't remember once or twice in the last 20 years there's been search warrants issued in one or two houses and backyards done up. Is that right? Can you give us more information on those? <clears throat> Yeah, the only search warrants we've ever done have been relatively recently. Um, and you, you are remembering correctly, we, we did uh, do a few searches of a home in Connecticut, uh, a home of a, a mobster. <coughs> we do believe as information about our paintings, but we also know he's never going to tell us what he knows. It's a dead issue. He's just never going to. Um, my funny little anecdote about that is when, when, we, when we did that backyard, people would ask me, hey, what was that about? Was that the gardener? And I'd say, I can't talk about it. But let me tell you folks, if you see a photograph of 40 FBI agents in me in someone's backyard, <laughs> <laughs> we're not looking for Jimmy Hoffa. <laughs> And one night she brought it and left it all on the Florida Museum. Bothering at all. 
right? Because in America, we're super sensitive. All we're doing is saying, we're gonna check a little closer, right? Let me give you a great example. This is what drives me nuts about the TSA, okay? Because we're so sensitive in the United States, we treat everybody the same. And that sounds beautiful, right? On, on its face, but let me tell you what that means. If I'm a Secret Service agent and I'm flying on business today, right, I can bypass security. I have my gun, I have to fly, I, I have my weapon, um, I go over to the side, I show the, the supervisor who I am, and they check you, they check the credentials, the state trooper checks them, and then you fly. It makes sense, right? Because what are they looking for? I'm telling them I have my gun in here, fly. I'm that same Secret Service agent a month later, and I'm going to Disney World with my three little kids and my wife, everything I hold precious in the world, and I don't even have a gun. And what does the TSA do? They put me through the ringer. They just let me fly with a gun last month. Now they're saying, well, you're a threat now. It doesn't make any sense. It's stupid. It's dumb security. Everything you do in security, whether it's protecting an aircraft, or a museum, or a person, should be based on risk. If you're not, if you're not implementing the security procedures with a focus on the risk, then you're being stupid, and you're wasting people's time, and you're taking your eye off the ball. So that really, that's where I think the TSA goes wrong. You have to look at what you know is a risk and a threat and focus on it. Thank you. One last question. Which one did you point to? Oh, the woman. Uh, in 2013, we held a press conference and we announced we know who the thieves are. Were. Yeah, we, held, we, we know who the thieves I, I were. Heard that. Yeah. But nothing more. Uh, and, and implicit in that is that we know that they didn't die in possession of the art. So it makes it hard. And then uh, I gave you guys a little hint before. Add the complicating factor that look where they could have hit them. You know, you could have hit them somewhere and died and not told anybody or what have you. That doesn't mean we won't find them. It means we have a heck of a lot of work to do. <coughs> Thank you so much. Folks.